All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here today. As, as you know, this panel is a, a new era for global health, and we're gonna be talking about the massive strides that have been made when we come to combating communicable diseases. But when you look at the preventative diseases that have long plagued the developed world, those are now being exported around the globe. It's a big paradigm shift, and it's one that existing health systems really aren't prepared for. So how we tackle these problems, it's something that all of these panelists have been thinking about and spending a lot of time on. Uh, I'll very quickly introduce our panelists today. Bill Gates, who through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, has invested $12 billion in global health, health just in the last five years, um, is involved with many of the people on this panel, and you're gonna hear more about that too. Also, Dr. Atul Gawande, sitting next to me, is a Harvard professor and a surgeon at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He also runs a lab that has been trying to tackle a lot of these issues, and as you probably know, he's a best-selling author on all of these issues as well. Uh, Jay Iyer is the executive director of, Access, the, of the Access to Medicine Foundation, um, and that's something you're gonna hear a lot more about too. And Arif Nakvi is the founder and CEO of the Abraj Group. That's the largest private equity fund focused on emerging markets with $13.6 billion in assets under ma management. Uh, they have a billion dollar fund they've launched for healthcare spending across Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia, and we'll hear more about that too. And as I mentioned, all of these people um, are working on the same areas, and some, many of them have worked together on some of these issues. Uh, Bill, I thought we'd start with you today. Uh, you know, there are all types of factors that are helping rewrite the global playbook right now. Uh, what do you think is the most significant of those factors? Well, the key thing is uh, staying the course in terms of the aid generosity, the R&D budgets. Uh, we're making great progress. It's never easy to invent these medicines. It's not easy to get the, the aid funding we need. And the delivery uh, piece in a lot of these countries has been tough to execute on. But overall, uh, since the year 2000, which is when Gavi was first introduced here at Global Fund a few years later uh, at uh, Davos. Then Global Fund uh, shows up a few years later. Uh, aid levels focused on health went up pretty dramatically in that period. Uh, we've seen an acceleration. You know, deaths have been coming down since 1960. Uh, in 1960, 20 percent of all children died before the age of five. Today, if you get outside war zones, there's no country in the world that has a 20% mortality rate. There's a few at 15%, uh, but we went from 10% in 2000 now to 5%. And the goal over the next 15 years, which is achievable, uh, these things don't always improve. If we don't fund or don't pay attention, they'd get worse. But if we stay the course, uh, if the innovations come through, we would get down to two and a half million. So two and a half percent would be an achievement. It would get us fairly close to health equity. That gets you uh, uh, the world level to a level that was in the US during the 1970s. Wow. Um, Atul, you say that dramatic reductions in premature deaths are, are, are possible. And Bill just talked about this too. What do you think we need to do? What are the primary steps of, of, of helping achieve that goal? Um, in a project funded by Gates Foundation with the World Bank, uh, we had the third uh, edition of what's called the disease control priorities analysis. And this is like a 10-year project to look at all of the public health interventions possible. And looking at the question of death by the age of 70, there are a large proportion of the deaths are preventable. Start with childbirth, where 99% of the deaths are preventable. But even all the way up to 70, we have solutions that are on the books that would cut death before 70 by 25% globally. They fall into a couple of categories. One is just plain policies, structural policies. These are things like smoking, uh, traffic safety uh, policies, air and water pollution and addressing those. They have big, um, they have big gains that are possible and we, we know those answers. Tobacco control, uh, there is a known set of approaches that, that governments can take that have remarkable effects. So then the second category is recognizing that we still have that under five mortality set of work uh, that Bill's been uh, especially focused on and, and lots of evidence that it's in fact all about that first 30 days of life um, at and around the time of birth and making birth uh, for mom and baby a uh, safer, higher quality experience. And, and we, have, uh, we have not invested enough in learning how to drive those better practices to scale. And then finally, um, there's the fact that as people, 
are getting advantage of uh, living past uh, early childhood illnesses, early infectious disease. We are living longer, and that opportunity to make it to 70 has to do with um, having a regular source of care over the course of your life because life is the accumulation of chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. a, th a third of the world has uh, high blood pressure in adulthood. Only 14% have it at under adequate control, and that has made it, uh, made it one of the biggest killers and biggest prevention opportunities for the, the big killer in the world, which is now cardiovascular disease. So the idea that we have platforms, and this is where universal health coverage becomes crucial, that we, are, we now know if we assure people a regular source of care and that your needed medications and treatments are affordable to you and have that consistently over the course of your life, we uh, are able to sustain years of life. We'll get a little deeper into universal health care later, but uh, Jay, why don't you tell us a little bit about how the Access to Medicine Foundation fits into this whole piece? Yeah. So um, for, for about 10 years now, we've been evaluating the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, they are the innovators and suppliers of uh, the world's uh, medicines and vaccines and some of them also involved in diagnostics. And we've been supported by the, the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the UK and the Dutch government in this, in this effort. So the way we work is that we first uh, try to analyze um, what is the social responsibility of the pharmaceutical industry working with multiple stakeholders. And the idea is to then transform that expectations from multiple stakeholders into metrics. We use those metrics to then invite companies to tell us how they perform against global goals like access to medicine uh, for the two billion who live without. And uh, we try to then uh, relay back information about uh, performance of individual companies. What are companies doing today about the issue? Um, how are they innovating? Uh, how, what are some of the major challenges that they face? Uh, what are some of the areas that they have been um, uh, thinking about where there are ideas, but they're not yet, yet into fruition? Um, and we try to bring best practices, because as competitive companies, there's not always an opportunity for one com company to understand what another company is doing. So um, how we work in, in, in this space is we try to encourage businesses to, to realize that this can be done. Uh, doing good business with a social impact can be done. And it doesn't jeopardize your financial standing. It is actually just smart business. I mean, we all uh, know uh, about the growth of, uh, of, uh, and the demand for, for healthcare is increasing. Um, I think many people have spoken about uh, Africa's population also uh, doubling in the next few years. Um, and that is an opportunity. And, and it's an opportunity that will only work if you not only think of selling your products, but you sell your products and you transform healthcare and improve healthy markets and healthy lives at the same time. Has it been a message that's been easier to communicate over time as the companies have kind of gotten used to these ideas? Has it gotten easier over the 10 years period? Certainly. I, I think um, what has helped a lot is there's been more international calls for, for action where the industry is working also with governments. I think this is a perfect forum uh, that brings together a lot of, these, uh, a lot of people in, into realizing what major health issues are. Another important thing is focus. Uh, I think as long as we understand what the key priorities are, it's easier for, for a business, for an enterprise, for an individual to say, okay, we need to focus on that particular issue and this is how we wanna drive forward. I think when you have a whole range of issues, that's when things get confusing and it's hard to, to ensure adequate finances are in the right places for that. But over time, I think um, commitment making has led to action taking. We have some data shown that um, in maternal health, in neglected tropical diseases, um, also in cancer care, it's, it's starting to, to, to show um, in access to medicine itself. And, and just yesterday, we published some work on uh, antimicrobial resistance, uh, how the largest companies in the world, whether they're uh, biotech companies or they are uh, big pharma companies or generic companies, address this particular issue in their own ways, using their own expertise, their own pipelines, portfolios, and their geographies. Um, and I think that's, that's been a message where many companies are already uh, believers in this. But we need them to stay on the market because there are many companies who are struggling in this market. And if major players leave the market, then we definitely have a big shortage of medicine. Sure. Uh, Arif, what, why don't you explain to us how you fit into this entire package? Because people might <laughs> not expect a private equity guy to be sitting on this stage. Uh, where, where does private equity fit in, and how did you get involved in this? So, so I have to say that um, I'm here on this platform not just as a representative of the private sector and private equity in more specific terms, but also of emerging markets. And emerging markets are a vast swathe of this planet with 75% of the world's population living within them. And we all, generally speaking, acknowledge that emerging markets are going to be responsible for two-thirds of global growth, of the majority of the increase in the middle classes, and of opportunity across different spectrums and different um, forms. 
And yet, despite all of that good news, our markets are also central and core to most of the problems that the world is going to face, either geopolitical or strategic, or even down to the micro level, such as healthcare and education. So we need to focus on these in these markets ahead of anyone else. And if there was one big uh, area and territory which was being run by one government, you could say that governments address it, but different governments have different priorities. And because it is such a diverse part of the world, it is important for the private sector to step in because we've all talked about impact, but without investment, there is no impact. I think that's a starting point that we all have to take for granted. And then you look at these markets and you figure out, look, they're, they're changing. There's a lot of positivity. And like Bill, I'm an optimist. So I believe the glass is half full, very firmly. I don't think of it as half empty, right? Mm -hmm. and, and when I look at these markets, I see a rapidly increasing population. I see urbanization growing at a dramatic pace, okay? But there are shadows between, within both of those uh, factors as well. Technology is being implemented, but there are shadows there as well. So how do you tackle the shadows? And the only way to do that effectively is to bring to bear the power of the private sector, its ability to innovate, and its ability to create change effectively and speedily that private equity gets involved in trying to make a difference. And even that's not traditional. So what um, we came up with, and I have to say that, you know, uh, Bill was instrumental in that vision because it all started with a discussion with him, which is that you can tackle the bottom of the pyramid, but there are so many measures that need to be dealt with in healthcare in our markets. Let's come up with an innovative solution. So while the West has advances in healthcare, people are living longer, healthcare is getting better. The reality is in our markets, you know, there are close to 100 million people that are being pushed into extreme poverty simply because of their healthcare costs and the fact that they have to um, meet those costs and that's why they can no longer afford to live um, outside of that poverty zone. And non-communicable diseases in our markets are going to account for 70% of deaths, right? So it's not just about the communicable diseases and the infectious diseases that Bill is so focused about and is eradicating at a rapid pace. The reality is that we also have to address the other side of this issue. Yeah. And to do that, we have to move to a different model. We have to start thinking differently. And that's where we came in. What we said was that yes, we can tackle through development agencies, through NGOs, through governments. There is an enormous level of goodwill and an enormous amount of effort that is being put into making change happen. But how do you galvanize the private sector? How do you get private money to come in and make a difference. So we said, let's create systemic change to start with. Let's talk about prevention rather than intervention. Let's create a platform across markets that is driven not just by the passion of a few, but by the inclusion of so many different stakeholders that can develop the outcomes that we want, that are measurable, that are capable of replication, and then make an enormous difference in overall healthcare. So that's what drove the vision. That's where we started. It's still early days. I wouldn't claim success. I wouldn't claim victory. But what I can claim is when you own 25 hospitals and when you bring to bear the fact that you have 30 clinics and you're treating 2 million patients a year already and you're collecting and aggregating data from the starting point, you're using the technological innovation to try and find ways of putting that band on people that costs only a cent and then suddenly data flows are two ways. When you're doing all of that, you will have an impact. And for that, you need investment. For that, you need private capital. And when you start with that and you focus on profitability, you will also get to sustainability. I understand the vision on all of that, but to attract additional private capital, you're going to need to show that you can make a profit on that too. Is Absolutely. That, is that uh, something, I know it's early days, but where do, where do you stand on that? At, this at the core too? of it. Look, I, I, I don't want to go into the specific numbers. I can if you want, but the reality is we're profitable already. When you're operating 24 hospitals and you're catering to the middle classes and you're in cities like... Uh, you know, in, in Kenya and in, in, in South, southern India, and you're operating these hospitals across a common platform because our focus was create the consistency and commonality of service across all of these markets. And the patients are coming in, you're collecting the data, you're aggregating the information, so suddenly you're of enormous value to equipment providers, not just to governments and NGOs, and you're of enormous value to pharmaceutical companies because at the end of the day, you are enabling them to understand through data the patients that they would like to serve. So no longer is it a generic medicine that is developed 
by FDA testing on white Anglo-Saxon males in the United States. It's now specifically tailored to the African or the Asian. And that's our vision. That's where we hope to get to. And if we start driving down that direction, let me tell you, the floodgates of capital will open because everyone wants to make a profit, and that's how it will happen. Right. Uh, Bill, you are obviously somebody who fits in in all three pillars of where the funding comes from for this. You're the giant in philanthropy uh, giving to this. You deal with governments all the time, trying to help direct some of that money, and then uh, working with, uh, with what we just heard about with private capital, too. How, how do those three pillars work, and where do we stand in terms of um, the major governments like the United States, what they're willing to do right now? <clears throat> well, the U.S. Uh, on the aid front, uh, starting in the year 2000, was uh, phenomenal in stepping forward with PEPFAR and President Malaria's initiative. And uh, actually, they're the majority of all HIV funding uh, through uh, PEPFAR and the Global Fund. So that's been quite phenomenal. You know, one way to think about this is there's primary health care, which is about child delivery, childhood vaccination, and treatments for infectious diseases. And that we need to get out to even the poorest, uh, every geography. And the cost of doing that and doing that well is not very high. There's uh, even some very poor countries in Africa like Ethiopia or Rwanda who do a very, very good job of it. Then as we get into the adult diseases and we get into higher income, the model is unlikely to be for all countries to make the hospitals government employees, government run. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you would have some type of insurance scheme, uh, either created by the government or regulated by the government, where it gives people access to a competitive private sector of services that's being properly measured in terms of the quality of what's being delivered. And India and China are pretty paradigmatic right now, where uh, there's a lot of good middle class consumers in both cases. Uh, and so can those markets be shaped? In some ways, what's going on there is more interesting than in the US, because they can never afford to spend $10,000 per citizen, which is what the US is spending uh, uh, on average for healthcare. So they have to innovate. So their willingness uh, to fund preventative measures, to uh, create more competition. Uh, you know, that's where a lot of the action will be. Uh, and so we'll have to take that, in some cases, move it up to the high income countries, in some cases, uh, move it down uh, to the, the poorest countries. So you know, we're, we're interested in getting a view of that, while our main priority is that primary health care uh, system. Uh, Atul, you are somebody who operates within the healthcare system. What do you think the fixes need to be? Where, where, where are the changes? So uh, the way I break it down in my mind is first access to care, yeah. and that requires. It's really a financing question. And uh, as we approach universal health coverage, we're seeing it happen at early and earlier stages of development. So when the United States, which still hasn't done universal access, but when we brought in Medicaid, which is for at least covered for people who are poor. That was in the late 1960s, and we were at $30,000 GDP per capita or thereabouts. Um, when Korea, South Korea did that in the late 1970s, at that point they were doing it, and they were just under $10,000 GDP per capita. Um, and now you see the BPL program in India, the below poverty line. You get a card. It assures you coverage. It's been phenomenally cost effective. It has raised lives and increased um, infrastructure. That uh, is happening at $1,500 wow. GDP per capita. So it's as if you started a Medicaid program when in the, in the 19th century US, which we would have been perfectly <laughs> capable of, right? So now I grew up, my, my father's from a village in India, and I've seen what that BPL card has done. Uh, you now have in that area a, a government hospital in the district that has uh, eight um, uh, surgeons and an anesthesiologists for a community of five million which is nowhere near enough. But in the private sector, there are now 120 surgeons that are in this community that hadn't been there before and building and, and now becoming a place that needs these group hospitals and start building the basic structures that go in. So then the second building block, you can build access, but I also see the quality is very poor. Uh, diabetes has now replaced malnutrition in, in, in our you know, agricultural community where uh, my father grew up, and uh, diabetes control isn't there, hypertension isn't there, 
cardiovascular disease. My, you know, the th three, big, three big killers are birth and access to emergency C-section and having it safe, um, road traffic accidents, and then chronic conditions like heart disease, diabetes resulting in heart attacks. And those components uh, are, are not there. Um, so you need surveillance of quality. Just the same way we monitor infectious disease outbreaks, we need to monitor outbreaks of horrible quality and then be able to have systemic responses. Is it a supply problem? Is it a skills training problem? The supplies of people and the, and, and the, the businesses there as the financing comes in, but we're less capable of that. So last example of this. In a nonprofit we started called Lifebox, we banded together low-income hospitals to have a guaranteed purchasing pool. We, we only had enough to guarantee a $1 million purchase of basic safety monitoring equipment for operating rooms. We wanted a design that was cheaper, that would last with power cuts, everything else. Uh, they were buying those hospitals at two to $5,000 per monitor. We got the price down to $189. Wow. Most operating rooms did not have basic monitoring for a mother who was needing a C-section or uh, and anesthesiologists were lowest totem pole. We now have completely supplied more than 25 countries and trained more than 6,000 an anesthetists in the basic skills and elevated their professional stature. So, th you know, those are the two components to me. You start with access, but then you have to come in behind with quality and surveillance of where does the chain of quality break down so you fix it. We spoke earlier, and when you talked about quality issues uh, in northern India where you were looking at these issues, uh, what was the major issue with quality? So this was a trial, uh, largest trial in childbirth uh, uh, quality ever done. Um, and in partnership with the Gates Foundation, the WHO, the government of India, and the government of Uttar Pradesh in the north of India. Um, there are seven killers for moms and babies. We've known how to save moms and babies for about half a century. Uh, you know you should wash hands to prevent infection. You should warm the baby. You should, uh, there's certain things you can do to prevent bleeding. 10% of babies are born with difficulty breathing and there are a couple things you can do to address that. Mm -hmm. The performance when we started measuring and doing the surveillance was very low. Less than 1% hand washing. 30% uh, um, without clean gloves. Uh, when we implemented a series of checklists for everybody to get data on what's this inventory supply, are people using, are they measuring blood pressure, what are the practices, what are the missing skills, and then provide an on-site coaching for everybody from the birth attendant to the leadership. We got them to 70% performance mm -hmm. across these measures. It was incredible across a large scale, and there was no mortality reduction. And that was the great disappointment, and we're now pulling apart and the reason is you still have all of these components to put together and 70% is not good enough. We have other places that get to 90% and the indicators are that if you can get it to 90%, you now have all the pieces that come together. So, you know, we are part way there. It's the kind of picture that people need to be able to see. And, um, and then exposing this data, you got to use it in a way it doesn't become weaponized, used to uh, shame and, and, uh, and to get people afraid of, of uh, exposing their faults and defects, and instead you become intensely curious about how you fix that. So, so there's still a deep culture I hadn't in thought medicine about that. to, to the challenge. The backlash that can come when Absolutely. you bring these issues up. Absolutely. Um, are, if you hear something like that, are these systems that you could implement in your hospitals? Have you all talked about these things? Or is that just further down the road after you build the system? No, I think, I think the point is that, that there isn't a point at which you reach and you say, okay, now I'll start doing uh, what he's talking about, and this is the right point. It's a continuous journey. It's a learning journey. And the most important thing about what we're doing, um, if you take a step back, you know, you asked me earlier about why private equity is involved. You have to also figure out that, you know, the world is changing, and more and more people are beginning to think of stakeholder engagement, not just shareholder returns. And Larry Fink's letter this year to his, his uh, stakeholders is not an accident. It's not that Larry's leading, reading the tea leaves. It is because more and more businesses around the world are beginning to realize that they need to focus on these issues. So, you know, the, the sustainable development goals weren't an accident. Yeah. It was the entire world coming together and saying, these are the objectives that the world needs to reach by a certain point. And the difference is that for far too long, business left it mm 
to governments and NGOs and development organizations to focus on the sustainable development goals. But if, you, you know, if you've been to the UN General Assembly week in the last couple of years, there's a third tribe that has come to war, and that's business, alongside the development agencies and the governments. And business is beginning to become not only inquisitive, but saying, actually, hang on a second, impact does not mean there is a trade-off. There is a trade-on to impact. You can do good and make profits at the same time. So it is only by developing a coalition of like-minded people from philanthropy to development institutions, to service providers, to equipment manufacturers and pharmaceutical companies and capital investors and thought processes like you've just articulated that go in at the start of the journey, that coalition is critical to getting the outcomes that we're talking about because it is outcomes that we want, not having to worry about intervention later on down the line when the problem is out of control. Because today we are at the beginnings of an epidemic. You know, we do have the fact that whilst we are making enormous uh, strides towards eradicating um, infectious diseases to a large extent driven by people like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I should say by, driven by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, right. not people like. Uh, but at the end of the day, when, when you see that, you also have the double disease burden, which is lifestyle is causing a change as well. Right. right, And we need to tackle both together. And actually, dealing with one leads to an identification of the other. Because if you start screening people, you start bringing them in, you start talking to them about educating them and empowering them with knowledge. And that is done by the private sector as well, because that is the next stage, is that they begin to take responsibility for their own outcomes. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very important point. And in the course of that journey, you find out if there's an infectious disease sitting lurking somewhere in the family or in their wider ecosystem. Jay, your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I mean, actually, we've seen a growing in interest also from the investor community in our work. Um, um, previously, the word access to medicine, uh, I think, was used as a, mostly as a rhetoric for, for um, issues like pricing and uh, IP management. Mm -hmm. And yes, those issues still exist today. There are um, occasions where uh, prices of individual drugs are uh, prohibiting uh, access. There are occasions where cost of healthcare is prohibiting, uh, prohibiting access. There are issues of good management of IP and bad management of intellectual property. But now I think we're starting to realize that access to medicine is, is in a way um, improving the lives of the many people who are now seeking health, health and, and health promotion itself. So, and I think that we've seen a, a tremendous growth in number of investors who have signed on to the principles of what we believe in, mm -hmm. uh, interested in the pharmaceutical industry, interested in the work of, uh, of, of the, my colleagues sitting here in, in the panel today, and have also spoken up. And Larry Fink's letter, I think, shows that. You know, there, is a, there needs to be a long-term thinking because some of these solutions cannot be solved in, in, in a week or a year or six months. It needs to be solved within 10 years. But in terms of how much capacity, how much financing both an in, a company has or the world actually has or a government has in order to secure that, that, is, that, is, that can be limiting. At the same time, I think what we've seen is a, an increased recognition of, of the fact that many companies are experimenting with very many different pilots around the world. And those pilots are now starting to only start to scale up um, or, or be replicated in other geographies. And that is of very uh, great interest to, to the people who are behind um, the financial firms and who invest in the pharmaceutical industry who invest in healthcare, who invest in hospitals, um, invest also in community health. So I think we're starting to see a, a big change um, already in the last five years, and we shouldn't stop now. Bill, you've made a lot of investments in innovation. Uh, what are some of the most exciting, most promising things that you see out there on the horizon that could make a big impact? <coughs> well, one thing that's been amazing is that uh, if you think of ritual disease, cancer, uh, heart disease, uh, and developing world disease, infectious disease is separate. Uh, if you get down at the research level, uh, there's actually a lot of commonality. So uh, HIV, which of course is a disease of the immune system, has forced, in terms of trying to come up with a vaccine for HIV, a, a much deeper understanding of how the immune system operates. And so as the cancer people uh, said, wow, uh, there's a, a immune system component that can be activated to fight cancer. The vectors and understanding that uh, had been funded by the U.S. government, ourselves, and others uh, helped in this immuno-oncology. Now they're, they've got uh, a lot of money, and so we're collaborating with them about the insights they're gaining uh, into the immune system. And so whereas HIV is contributing to cancer now, 
Uh, it's going to be cancer uh, contributing to HIV over time. Another great example of this is the uh, microbiome. Uh, our foundation, uh, starting about eight years ago, uh, funded these microbiome studies because the whole issue of nutrition is malnutrition, uh, is deeply mysterious because you can have kids who have an identical diet, which is clearly enough calories and it's clearly enough micronutrients, but some of those kids, uh, their gut gets into a, a bad state, an inflamed state, it's called enteric enteropathy, and they're not absorbing the nutrients. Uh, so they get sicker, they don't develop physically, they don't develop mentally, uh, they go on. Uh, the easiest thing to measure is they're stunted, that is their height never achieves the level that it should, but uh, along with that, although we're not good at measuring it, likewise, they suffer even more in terms of, of, of brain development. So we are funding these twin studies where we could restore uh, the gut state by uh, taking the twins' uh, gut and, and uh, putting in that and the other. We show we could restore by certain dietary things like butyrate that uh, uh, first people don't understand that. Well, thank God we have all this uh, genetic sequencing so we can take these complex uh, population of bacteria that live in your gut and really characterize it at, at quite low cost. And so we were getting deep insights. Now, rich world medicine has come along and looked at the microbiome, not just for diseases of the gut, but you name a disease, uh, there's a startup company working on the microbiome to cure that disease, all the way from schizophrenia to Alzheimer's, uh, you name it. And it's, it's not as crazy as it sounds, although there'll be some very high failure rate in aggregate. You have hundreds of companies. And, and uh, the thing that's most exciting right now is the overnutrition, obesity crisis in rich countries. The pathway is mediated by the microbiome. Uh, and... And so, you know, there's a certain irony that now the rich world that views it more in terms of overnutrition is coming in uh, with R&D money that will elucidate the pathways that we need to understand where our, our focus of this is undernutrition. Uh, last example I'll give, because there's too many, uh, prematurity has been grossly underfunded in the rich world. It's a tragic thing. Uh, there's quite a a racial difference in the US in terms of rates of prematurity over a factor of two. Uh, the way the NIH institutes were set up uh, and the relative money given to the different ones meant that this was somewhat underfunded. And so we got involved. We actually used 23andMe data to look at uh, profiles relative to premature delivery and discovered that a uh, selenium, which is a very, very, very small part of your diet, uh, that if you have a selenium deficiency, it raises your uh, prematurity rate by a factor of five. And that's only because we had that longitudinal study where some rich women who have bad genes for processing selenium showed these elevated rates. And now we're actually out in a field trial uh, uh, trying to reduce that. And that's super significant because as Atul said, of the under five deaths, which are under five million now, uh, uh, it's almost half are in those first 30 days. And those were fairly mysterious, uh, but now we're doing these minimally invasive autopsies and getting deep understanding. So anyway, the research agenda for uh, rich world and developing world are way more aligned uh, than you might think. Uh, and that's why we have these partnerships with the pharmaceutical companies. Just one word about that is before the Access to Medicine Index came along, your best strategy as a pharma company was to never work on infectious diseases and promise that if you accidentally discovered something, it would be free. <laughs> and then the poor companies that were working on infectious diseases would be under pressure that, oh, if you discover something, you should you know, lose uh, lots of money by giving it away for free. Yeah. Because now we're actually going and say, oh, you get credit for working on these areas. If you have appropriate tiered pricing yeah. where the rich countries pay back most of the R&D, the middle income pay back some of the R&D, and the poorest countries get marginal cost pricing and pay back none of the R&D. Now, you know, the, the relative rankings in this index, uh, because people are competing as they want to employ yeah. uh, smart kids, the relative rankings have improved quite dramatically. And, you know, Pete, 
we meet with the pharmacist CEOs, the CEO farmers on a regular basis. We have a, uh, a, a face-to-face meeting with all of them. You know, they're disappointed when their ranking oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> isn't very good, and that's yeah. that's competition and excellence that we're super happy to see. Jay, you, you have additional thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. It's um, I mean, it's 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 a job, right? I mean, for yeah. the last uh, many years, um, I mean, when a comp- when a company does poorly on the on the on the ranking. Um, it creates questions, and it also creates frustration for the internal staffers in the companies who are who are struggling to, right. to get ideas uh, across, sometimes to their leadership, sometimes to the investors behind the leadership. Um, and I think that's something that, that you have to be cognizant about, like empowering the individual people who work in these companies with good ideas, listening to their ideas and trying to find solutions to, to bring that out. Clarifying the actual responsibility of the areas not to go into and the areas to go into, where should the priorities actually stand? That is hugely empowering to a lot of companies. Hmm. I mean, how would a company like um, Johnson & Johnson know that their nursing program actually saves uh, out of eight children uh, who, who, you know, one of the things that they do in the nursing program is they teach about uh, resuscitation of babies um, uh, when, they're, when, they're, when they're born and they don't breathe. And, um, because of their program, they end up teaching um, uh, the, the caregivers who, who are birth attendants um, how to resuscitate the babies. Um, there's, uh, instead of eight babies dying, there's only one baby dying. And we started showing that, and it's a powerful video to show to many different CEOs, and some CEOs in the room have actually seen that video. And it tells you that you, know, it's, you have to work on, on access to medicine issues at the product level, because that's what your core responsibility is. And that's the area which is highly competitive for, for the pharmaceutical industry. And there's also this non-competitive space in terms of what skills you can bring forward. Um, I'll give an example of Johnson Johnson uh, in Merck uh, KGAA. What they do is they, they really start looking at um, health education. Uh, they know that the bulk of uh, healthcare workers um, and access to, to doctors is mostly at the urban setting in a country like India. Mm-hmm. So they decided to focus on the rural setting and, and build um, healthcare facilities and, and partner with multi, multiple organizations on those kind of issues. And you see those examples everywhere. Eli Lilly, they, they recognize the growing middle class in, in, in China and have built a specific program on that. Um, a, com- a company like Novartis, they look specifically at, okay, we've got a base of the pyramid uh, a program, we've got an ability to pay a program for the, for the high income brackets. And what are we doing with the social enterprising of the, of the, uh, the, the working poor? Mm-hmm. So I think that kind of innovative ideas, um, balanced with great innovations also in the, the product development pipeline itself, I think is what is transforming the way healthcare is, is addressed in the global uh, era. Um, Atul, I saw you making some notes and nodding through some of these. Is there a point that you wanted to bring in on that? When I'm in this level of discussion, I get overwhelmed by the complexity. <laughs> and so then I start drawing pictures yeah. to make more sense of it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think the, the, this is the way I break it down. In the last century, we have doubled the human lifespan of the average highest income part of the world. We went from a 40-year life expectancy in 1900 to now you know, if you have a regular source of care and need of medications, an average survival of 80 years is, is a part of our capacity with the right policies also at a national level. So then how do you begin to put those pieces together? And I think they come in stacks. And I think we're hearing about the different stacks yeah. as we talk our way through this. One stack, which is often the very first one we build, is a hospital stack. Mm-hmm. Because that one, I can rescue people. It's a controllable space. I can hire folks into it. We put surgery in there. You know, you need surgery as part of your lifespan. Um, Five billion people don't have access to safe, adequate surgical care, and increasing financing and things like that starts making availability of emergency C-section trauma care and so on. But that's only one stack. As we move away from the hospital, it gets harder and harder to get your hands around it. So uh, medication infrastructure and the procurement processes, and whether we make the world of the other five billion as opposed to the two billion, viable, actual markets where you reduce uncertainty and you have, and you have capacity to make that quality work. Mm-hmm. And then the, the third big stack is, um, uh, and we're gradually separating, so it really becomes two, has been the primary health care and the, the, the birth uh, components. And you know, those are now moving much closer to the community, feel more out of control. You don't have a good handle on what's going on. And I think we're learning, however, that Primary health care is a pretty basic thing. It has four functions. You've got, as a human being, you need over the course of your life a, a 
a point of first contact for the majority of your medical needs. You have a fever, you have prevention, you have mental and behavioral health issues. If you have built a primary health capability that reaches into communities, that, um, that combination of a primary health care clinic with a community health worker in higher income co countries, it could be a nurse population health manager. In lower income countries, it are, it are these cert certified CHWs, but they're connected into the system. Mm -hmm. Right, first contact access, continuity. They are able to follow you over time and see the trend of your life. Coordination, oh my gosh, you need to get to the specialist. You need to get to, the, to, to testing. You need to get to the hospital. And then the final one is growing comprehensiveness so that it can handle larger and larger stack of that care. Those are the basic building blocks, and I feel like we are now, what you're hearing here is people are wrapping their minds around making different parts of them work, even though we were talking at high speed about different, different parts of the stack. Right. All right, yeah. So, you know, I mean, hearing you and talking about the stacks, I thought, let me try and disaggregate that even a little bit more. And, and folks, after this, we'll open the floor up to your questions, too. And, and, and try and sort of make it even simpler, at least in my own head, which is actually the conclusion I'm coming to is that healthcare is everybody's business, yeah. okay? It's not just the remit of governments. It's not just the remit of non-governmental organizations or development agencies or philanthropic uh, entities. It is actually everybody is involved. And what you just said about community health workers actually tells me that the key for us to all, all of us to figure out is that task shifting is critical. The community health worker that originally went in to just identify a very singular basic need that could then be researched and, and, and implemented or acted upon is now capable through technology or just through basic task shifting and further education is capable of doing what you just said, which is to help a person navigate that medical journey or that health journey. And by empowering people with more knowledge and information, that takes it one level further up. So to me, when we say healthcare is everybody's business, what we're actually talking about is a systemic change. What we're talking about is a systemic change in the way we think about healthcare. It's not a revolution, but it is coming pretty clear to it, which is let's start thinking in a completely different way, which is that if we are really going to begin to start to focus on outcomes rather than, uh, than and prevention rather than uh, uh, you know, looking at it the way that we used to traditionally, then it's very clear to me that public-private partnerships, philanthropy, and business partnerships, and a, a much greater emphasis um, throughout the value chain on different elements of it coming together to supplement each other. Right now, there was be, there's been too much of, I'm doing this better, so let me get more profitability out of my outcome as opposed to someone else. The example you gave of the way different pharmaceutical companies are behaving and attacking different parts of the value chain. I think this is all very beneficial and where every step we're taking right now is towards systemic change and is towards outcomes and is actually making the healthcare into a business that everybody can participate in. All right, folks, we'd like to open the floor to questions that you may have as well. If you have a question, just raise your hand. We'll get a microphone right over to you. Uh, I see a question right here. And if you don't mind introducing yourself to the panel uh, as you ask your question too. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Praveen Nair. Thank you for the information you provided on the panel. I'm a business school professor, so I don't profess to know too much about healthcare. Uh, but I have a basic question, which is, uh, is there a skills gap in healthcare provision, not only among providers, but also among patients? Should we all be taking more responsibility for our own care? And related to that is the cost to train uh, providers. We as a university find it would be very, very expensive uh, to train uh, medical practitioners. Thank you. Who'd like to tackle that? I can take it first, but sure. So, I mean, I think that it, the personal responsibility is, is immense. Um, we've never seen it as much as in, in this issue, uh, antimicrobial resistance. Teaching somebody about hand washing, as uh, one of my colleagues here just spoke about, um, teaching patients um, and mothers to, to vaccinate their children, is, it is also our responsibility as we do our work very you know, fine-tuned into pharmaceutical industry or whatsoever. I think um, one of the things that we really have to look at is what is the patient's responsibility in um, using uh, products like antibiotics. And that's an area where I think we've seen a lot of movement from governments. We've seen now movement from the pharmaceutical industry. We've seen movement from various different donors investing in, in key areas. But it's hard to quantify the, the movement of, of, of people, like what are individuals doing about this particular issue? Because I, I think we all know in different countries, when we go to different countries, how, do we, how, do, how access to healthcare uh, works in, in, in Singapore, where I'm from, versus uh, the Netherlands, where I now live, versus um, uh, in India, where you know, they're all very different, where my, where my family lives. 
You know, so it's, I think that's something where a personal responsibility is important. We've seen um, education programs uh, playing an important role, campaigns from, from governments playing an important role. Uh, going beyond the red line campaign uh, is necessary because a pharmacist will see the red line, but he still has a certain mechanism of how he sells in a, in, in a country like India. That, so there needs to be definitely much more awareness of, of these issues and a system to, 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 do, to deal with it. I'm going to disagree. Take, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, it bothers me when we say that, that the central issue is personal responsibility. Um, you know, uh, when we have underperformance, whether it's by clinicians or by people in their daily lives, and we say, well, we should train them more. Yeah. And then we get really disappointed that the training only gets a modest amount of improvement and lots of people don't, don't do the thing we want them to do, quit smoking, eat better exercise. Then, then we say, okay, let's, let's have incentives and penalties. Um, which are expensive, and then we're disappointed by the amount of gain you get from that. The, the things that work are making it easier to do the right thing. Don't make it hard not to do the right thing. You know, tobacco control, for example, for the first 20 years, it was all about get people to take personal responsibility and quit. Well, this is an incredibly addictive substance designed to make it so you can't quit. So, uh, so we moved to tobacco control. Five years yeah. now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. See? Uh, we moved to tobacco control. A, tax the hell out of it so it is m much less likely to be bought in the first place. You, um, uh, you, you cut off access in vending machines and, and schools and you enforce under 18 you know, provisions. These basic steps have had dramatic effects on it by treating it not as purely a human failure but a design problem. And I think it's across the board that's true around many of the things that we talk about. Uh, HIV medication was a 13 pill a day kind of thing. It was difficult to stay on. You had high rates of not being on it. And we could talk about personal responsibility or make a one pill a day mm -hmm. uh, medication. And now people are moving to, you know, we still have 25% of people on HIV, even in the high income countries, who are not taking their medication. Now we're moving to uh, companies generating a one shot per quarter right. kind of solution that can address it and just make it easier to get to do the right thing. I, I think that's crucial and far less expensive and more effective. Well, even in the example you gave about, about uh, hand washing, where 95% uh, of the people in these clinics weren't washing their hands, I asked you why. And you said it was because they didn't have running water. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Correct. <laughs> Correct. You can't wash your hands and when so there's then, no running water. So then we brought in three options. You, you know, install piping. <laughs> there are budgets for it. Yeah. Uh, number two, uh, alcohol-based hand rubs, and there's a supply, and you can get it into uh, Indian clinics. Or third, this was the most common one they, that they used, was ask the sweeper in between cleaning the rooms, bring back a fresh basin of water from the tap or the well, and a, put a bar of soap nearby, and you can bump up hand washing rates tremendously, or you can just yell at them, why aren't you washing your hands, right? Right. right. Um, <laughs> does anybody want to tackle the second part of that question, which I think was how much it costs to train medical professionals? Am I right? Does anybody have any thoughts or expertise on that? Yeah. Well, the, the high impact stuff in the poorest countries is primary health care, yeah. and that's not about doctors. Uh, and it's not actually very complicated training. Now, the rules there are most one year of training. Uh, now, the middle income countries are probably going to have to innovate in terms of defining these roles. You know, in India today, they have a class of real doctors, but it's, it's very small compared to the large group that is perhaps pejoratively called quacks. Uh, some of those quacks are really good and some are not, but because they don't meet the ultimate standard, the ability to sort out which ones are good at, saying, doing TB treatment or not is very tricky. So the government probably will have to embrace a more complex set of qualifications, not just taking the, the British or US uh, uh, standard. So the labor markets uh, will change somewhat in order to not have the, the costs uh, be Western style. Okay. Other questions? Uh, I see a hand right here in the front. Hi, I'm David. I'm a global shaper from Kingston, Jamaica. So I'm representing uh, a developing country in that hemisphere. And I'd like to just thank you all for your insights in this riveting discussion. Um, my question is sort of in reference to two things. One, given the idea that developing countries have served as 
uh, platforms for solutions to communicable diseases, many of which have been driven by developed countries on one hand, and on the other hand, um, the idea that the topography of disease profile in developed and developing countries are approximating. What is the role for uh, harnessing the horsepower in developing countries, which, as Arif mentioned, have uh, a substantive proportion of the world's population, and so in thus uh, provide uh, an abundance of data points. And the developing countries often have less frictitious regulatory environments, and so one would imagine that implementing the systems level changes to which Atul uh, references may a bit more, may be a bit more sort of nimble. Um, what is the role for harnessing these countries uh, in providing solutions to, to problems that develop, developed countries have faced but have not been able to solve? Uh, Arif, you want sure. To so, you know, the first part of your question I didn't quite understand because it almost implied that developing countries are a laboratory for uh, outcomes driven and solutions that are emanating from developed countries and, and that's where it's getting tested. I think it's much more than that. I think that is where the problem is and that is why a large proportion of research and thinking is going to eradicate infectious diseases in those places. But to go back to the core of your question, um, which is that you know in these countries there is a greater capacity to innovate simply because the rules and regulations are not there. Well, you know, Try walking into a government department in Nigeria, okay, or in Pakistan. Trust me, they may not have that many rules and regulations, but they've got one thing called bureaucracy, right? And that trumps anything else. So, so that is the same all over the world. Every one of these markets has their own challenges. And some of these markets, the challenges are overcome by very strong leadership right at the top. So, you know, probably as Bill will testify, going to Rwanda is a different outcome compared to going to Nigeria because there the leadership is driving thinking and outcome. And in a more developed economy in that part of the world, the United Arab Emirates, you've got an enormous impetus from the leadership to go make change happen, which is why change happens. But in many places, the challenges are fundamental. The challenges are the same. You still need an enormous amount of effort to get things done. The difference is that technology can be a big enabler in these markets because you're going from 1G to 4G in one generation. You're missing out all of the fundamental problems that come from technological innovation being applied in these markets. So M-Pesa couldn't have happened anywhere else other than Kenya, right? So I think that that is the route to market that is going to be the fastest implementation agent to change. And I think we should embrace that and think more about how technological solutions can help governments overcome uh, their inherent mistrust of anything different or new. It, one, one key point about this is, even the developing world expects their medicines to be approved by the gold standard regulators. Uh, you know, there was a rotavirus vaccine uh, that had a very rare side effect, uh, so-called bowel in a susception rate. And it could have saved a million lives uh, for a few thousand cases of in a susception. But once the US said, okay, that's not good enough for us, where the risk of death was low enough that that was a good decision for the US, there was no way India was going to touch it. Uh, and likewise, in, in places like South Africa, where we have huge HIV prevalence, you'd think they'd be willing to try new things and do different things. But unless it's F FDA or EMEA approved, which are the two gold standard regulators, it doesn't get in. In most cases, that makes sense, because medicine, uh, you really want to be careful about it. In a few cases, they should say, hey, we have emergency situation, we should do something special. But uh, the best solution over time is to get more gold standard regulators. We're working with the Chinese FDA to raise their standards, and the hope is in a five-year time period, they will be a, a gold standard regulator, and which is very important for China, but also China is an exporter to other countries. Bill, on that point, you're also trying to get the regulators to streamline the process and make it happen more quickly uh, in some other... No, we've had a, uh, you know, both FDA and EMEA, the European regulator, uh, have been great to work with. Like on, <laughs> it's very strange, they're called to work on things like uh, malaria drugs where there's, you know, no domestic burden, and yet they do it. Uh, on things like TB drugs, uh, because it's a multiple drug regimen, they've had to create uh, special approaches for us. 
And I'd say the last several FDA commissioners, including the current one, Scott Gottlieb, mm -hmm. have been very willing to understand the special needs uh, that we have. You know, they still are going to be incredibly demanding. Uh, like if we have patient dropouts, uh, you know, they always score that against you as though they had bad side effects. So they're, they're still pretty tough. But we have a, a good regulation. In fact, we have some ex-FDA people who are helping us a lot in this Chinese I meant the regulators uh, over, process. yeah, the regulators in China and other places. That's where you're exactly. trying to speed things through, right? But can uh, I RF? just add something slightly provocative there, Bill? And I don't know, maybe I'm being a bit simplistic, but you know these gold standard regulators and the drugs that are approved um, in the United States or Europe, essentially also there is one big flaw in it which we're beginning to understand, although I don't think we fully comprehended it yet, which is the testing has taken place on genetically... Uh, as balanced uh, uh, an outcome-based thought process as that regulator can get in a particular market. But what is a fact is that we are all different. And the more data we can get on people of African origin or Indian origin or more uh, tailored medicine that can be implemented, which can only happen when we aggregate and receive more information about our own health out outcomes, I think even that regulator will begin to become a more focused and targeted provider of outcomes. Well, of course, when we're testing malaria medicines, we're doing the trials in Africa Obviously. where the disease burden is. So you have a perfect match between where you're going to deploy it and where you do your trials. In that instance. There, there are some cases, but it, it'd be easy to over case, overstate where you have gender differences or genetic differences. For example, how quickly you process certain medicines. And yes, the, these regulators are so sophisticated, they're starting to pay attention to that. In some cases, they'll overpay attention to that. You know, there'll be a few cases where they pay under attention. But that's the kind of thing that only a very sophisticated regulator would be able to look and say, okay, what's the diversity of genetic profiles that you looked at? You know, did you cover these variants? A lot of those things need what you might call a phase four, where, you know, if a trial is, say, 10,000 or less, you're not going to catch, you know, two per 100,000 type variation. You need to be out in the community and seeing any adverse events and really trying to understand what the correlations there are. And that's very difficult in the developing world. And that capacity is being built up. You know, the, the general view uh, that I'll be bold enough to say is that the first time approval should be a little better, but then the follow up to make sure there's no problem, that should be even tougher. It shouldn't be once you get through that gate. Uh, you know, it's ready for $7 billion. Don't need to come back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd like to squeeze in one more question right here. Tina Candela, Kimach TV, Russia. I have two questions. If we find I think we only have time for one, okay. so pick one. Yeah. If we find a way to live forever, do you think humans will live their lives in a different way? And will humans take fewer risks as a result? Uh, to be... <laughs> Please. Oh, to Bill? <laughs> um, Bill, she'd like you to answer. And I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I'm not sure that I understood it. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. If we find a way to live forever, do you think humans will live their lives in a different way? Oh, if we could live forever. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we're right. not working on life extension, but there are books like uh, Sapiens, Homo Deus, that you know, start to speculate oh, yeah. that as famine and disease become solved problems and you have these long longevity, what would it mean? Uh, you know, that's still probably a generation or two away from being a, a big problem. Although it's interesting, the, the, um, uh, we've already, you know, we've had this one case study of the last 100 years where we've gone from a 40-year life expectancy to 80-year life expectancy, yeah. and it's had a dramatic effect on the way that we live and, and, uh, and how we expect things to go. One is that we then we spend most of our lives feeling we are immortal, mm -hmm. and therefore we spend an inordinate amount of money on the last year of life um, out of a belief that, uh, that we don't need to address questions of what's the quality of life you want versus quantity of life. Mm -hmm. And there are good trials and ways that we're trying scaling up in my organization. To make it so, you're asking uh, uh, what are your goals for your quality of life as well as quantity of life? What, do you, what is the minimum quality of life you would consider acceptable versus not uh, right. acceptable, right. and being able to draw those lines. So you know, as we went from age 40 to age 80, basically uh, in 1900, 
There was no phase in your life in which you were not at risk of death. The re getting, uh, you, being young, being middle-aged, being old, you, you had a high risk of death, and so uncertainty about life and, being, uh, and living in a, in a state of perspective that at any time your life may go led people to be much more aware about what mattered in the quality of life versus yeah. quantity of life. And so we, we, have, uh, we have that experiment. So if we went from 80 years to 120 years to 160 years, I think it's just like we'll have this extended adolescence of believing we are immortal. <laughs> and, then, and then we come face to face with the fragilities and the, uh, and the losses of life just become delayed. Immortality becomes a fundamental transformation since our whole uh, family structure, everything else is built around the idea of eventually it, dying. You know, We've got 20 seconds. So yeah, everybody, everybody who's in business and finance has heard the saying of John Maynard Keynes, which is in the long run, we're all dead. And, <laughs> and that reality actually is what drove short-termism and a lot of financial market thinking in the first place. Last year or the year before, the Oxford Martin School came out with a report that was headed up saying, this is the best time to be alive. Yeah. And I looked at it and I was a bit cynical because I thought it's the only time I'm alive, so what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and, then, and then that brings home to you the reality that, hang on a second, this is the only time you're alive, make that life count, and going back to would you do things very differently, I think all of us, it is incumbent, especially the privileged people that are sitting here, yeah. it is incumbent on us to try and make the world a better place than the one that we landed up in. Part of it is about life expectancy, enhancing the quality and value of life. Part, is it, or part of it is doing what you can to make a difference. But all of it is about living well and fully. And that's a perfect note to end this on. We're supposed to come back and summarize what we learned, but I told that. So thank you, everybody.